Welcome back to Deprogrammed. This is the new Culture Forum show committed to fighting back against the forces of ideological conformity, particularly among the young. My name is Harrison Pitt. I'm a senior editor at the European Conservative, and I'm thrilled to be rejoined this week by Evan Riggs, who is a freelance journalist and is now back, back, in, the in, mother action. back in action in the mother country after a brief sojourn in the New World. And our special guest this week, Samuel Martin, editor-in-chief of the Mallard, a socially and culturally conservative magazine. Now, Sam, um, quick one to begin with. Are you encouraged by the recent defection of uh, Lee Anderson from the Tories to reform? Um, not especially. Uh, this is not to say that I think that Anderson should have remained with the Tories. Rather, I think that it is a sign that reform is increasingly becoming a recycling unit for the political establishment. Mm. I think that rather, first off in Rochdale, they reused a Labour MP mm -hmm. who lost, and Lee Anderson, who has gone from being part of one of the most inert governments in British history to a most likely ex-MP. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that Lee Anderson's defection will mean much for the right. It very much feels as though that the Reform UK is aligning itself to be a solution, not to the disaffection of the country, to the British people, but, um, but rather an attempt to resolve a factional dispute within the parliamentary party, the parliamentary conservative party, um, which knowing what we do about Westminster is hardly ideologically and politically aligned with the rest of the country. So in functional terms, it is more or less indistinguishable from, for example, the European Research Group and the Conservative Party, which existed and put lots of pressure on Theresa May in like 2017, 2018. The difference there being that it was actually formally part of the party, that that doesn't apply in this case. But nevertheless, there is still a kind of there, 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 there's a ragged boundary between reform and the right of the Tory party. And as such, it makes it difficult for reform to distinguish itself and to actually pose a, a, a real direct challenge to re potentially replace the Conservative Party. You don't see that as potentially um, taking place. Well, I think that we've, I've spoken about this for several years, as, as have many others, which is that there is certainly a benefit to having a smaller right-leaning party mm -hmm. to put pressure on the Conservatives from the outside, because admittedly there's only so much that you can do from the back benches. Mm. Um, however, uh, I think that the way that reform is pitching itself, having, a, you know, we saw what Farage said after the PopCon event, which was essentially, well, there are a lot of people here that believe what we believe in Reform UK. It's like, mm. well, hang on a minute. We know for a fact that popular conservatism has a, isn't particularly popular. I know that's pretty cliche, but, yeah, yeah. but we know it to be, to be true. Um, there is no excitement for uh, orange book liberalism wrap, uh, wrapped in a union jack. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. We, we, we really don't need another... Uh, we don't really need another brand of uh, Thatcherism trying to mutate into something relevant. Mm -hmm. We are in, I think, new waters now, mm -hmm. and we require, uh, you know, new captains. We require new uh, lieutenants, and so on and so forth. Um, this constant shifting about chairs on the Titanic, I really don't think, is going to help much. And as such, I don't think that a member of the Tory Party moving to the Reform Party. Even if part, like fringe parties or like you know outrider parties, than, like as a general concept or a general practice, can be good, I don't think that um, reform is going to make the impact that it could have uh, on the upcoming general election. And I certainly don't think that Lee Anderson's defection, as you know, the, poor, the, the circumstances of defection were quite poor. I think that the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Tories and also the right-leaning press could have done a better job at defending him. Uh, after, after his comments on... Yes, Khan, yes, yeah. I think that they could have done a far better job of that. The general consensus, or the silent consensus amongst much of the, of the right was effectively, well, Lee Anderson is, you know, his words were, 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 were clumsy and anti... Intemperate. Yeah, yes, an anti-intellectual an anti, anti and, mm. uh, you know, and a little bit crass and, oh and crass and vulgar. Uh, what, what he meant to say was, and, yeah, yeah. you know, this is, you know, I think that this is, at this point, it's like... It's not good enough. Are we actually political, are we actually a political movement or are we just the tone police? Mm -hmm. like, 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 I just, I, just to revert back to your question, sure. I, yes, I... I I don't think that, uh, yeah, parties that, are, that ride to the right of the Conservative Party can absolutely have an influence. Um, but 
only when they're actually to the right of Conservative Party and not defining themselves on a very narrow, what seems to be a very narrow and technical issue. Do you think it actually makes reform look kind of weak that basically the biggest announcement that they can give is that they're a safety net for people who get booted out of the Tories? I think that that's a, that's a massive drawback. I think that if you want to pitch yourself as like uh, a party that's actually going to, if, if, you, if reform is what it says, because you know they went and they rebranded themselves as reform, the Brexit party, it's like, hey, remember us? Mm. Um, they seem to want to, even if, they do, if they, even if they're doing the political activities under a different name, mm -hmm. they still very much want to retain the spirit of what they were doing in the 2019 European elections, which was the idea of we're going to change politics for good. We're going to fully upend the establishment. And now it's like we are, the, as you say, like the safety net for Tory MPs who, you know, again, admittedly, bad circumstances, bad treatment, aren't actually producing a roster of candidates and policies which is as this as as their slogan goes as is the as is supposedly the essence of their movement to change politics for good but is it not the case and so uh, uh, what you say is very well taken but is it not the case because precisely because reform has set itself up as a separate legal and corporate and political entity mm. from the conservative party which, and you're saying that that's only really like a, a, a de jure thing de facto it's more of a it's more of a sort of recycling plant and there is certainly some truth to that but by is it not possible that reform could nevertheless they're not necessarily going to um going to achieve any kind of not going to make any kind of um sufficient achievement but they might perform the necessary function at this point in britain british history at least of just completely uh, uh, dis uh completely cleansing uh the, the tory party and what i mean by that is is this like the problem is is that the conservative party at the moment is such a it's such, it's such a sort of ragtag of different yes. factions and interests. It's it well, united by one issue that has in large part depleted in relevance. Well, what was that issue? You mean the, the hatred of the Labour Party? I suppose. Oh, I mean, OK, well, two issues then. Yeah. <laughs> Which one were you thinking? Which oh, one were I was, you thinking? Like, because I was thinking of Brexit. Oh, well, of course, there was, there was the idea was like, we're going to try and gather together as many people who support yeah. Brexit and get it over a line. It's yeah, like, yeah. great, now that's done. Yes. And start betraying the revolution. I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, of course, that 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 alignment was uh, which occurred in 2019 hmm. has certainly been like completely wasted. But nevertheless, there are still these hangers-on in the Conservative Party. I don't even know how many people in the Conservative Party I would regard as sort of authentically conservative. But what I'm basically saying is, is that because let's let's just say I, I roughly 80% of them would probably be better off ideologically in the Lib Dems. If reform can just put a stake through the heart of the Conservative Party, it is sufficiently disliked by people like Penny Mordaunt. For them not to, it's not like Penny Morden is going to find herself in mm. in reform. They might, um, they might nevertheless peel off that sort of fifteen twenty percent of sound conservative MPs who would come into reform and would consolidate that that uh, conservatism in reform. Replace uh, and they would replace the Conservative Party and all of these people in the Conservative Party who had regarded that as the place to be would all of a sudden have to defect to the Lib Dems and no one would vote for them. Of course, I mean, like you can say that. Um you know, even if they don't provide a fatal blow or they don't provide a, uh, you know, a particularly groundbreaking change mm -hmm. or if they don't provide, uh, if they don't apply a, a, a sufficient degree of damage, at least they are doing some form of, of, of political damage. Indeed. Um, I think Which that, I think will have a clarifying effect. I didn't, didn't mean cleansing so much as clarifying. Like yes. pe People would have to say that this is where I stand and they'd no longer be able to... Uh, feign a, a conservative attitudes within a party that calls itself the Conservative Party. That if the Conservative Party is killed off and reform is 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 effectively there to replace it as the sort of the new representative of the right in British politics, like because Farage is at the head of it, Penny Mordaunt and all of the, all of the wets and pinkos are not going to join uh, reform. They, they they'll have nowhere else to go. Whereas that twenty percent spearheaded by people like Lee Anderson may be able to come into reform and then people like us would feel as though we had more, not perfect because reform isn't perfect, but would feel as though, and we, and we can maybe get into ideologically ways in which they're not, not completely sound, but we would have much more in the way of representation at Westminster. Uh, I think the repre uh, representation in Westminster at the very least, it can definitely send a message, but it, and mm. I think this ties nicely into what you said about ideology, which is that is it going to send the right message or is it going to send a message that is going to be contaminated somewhat? Mm. The, like, despite their loss in Rochdale, the Reform Party seems to be, Reform UK, seems to be still riding on this idea that uh, we need to destroy the con-socialists and we need to, we need to <laughs> defeat anti-Semitism and we can't have socialism in this country mm -hmm. and whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
like like if if the like message from that like it's just it's quite easy for a message uh, a message that is sent by voting reform can just as easily be taken oh we the conservative party have not done enough on mm. tackling anti-Semitism. We mm. haven't done enough. We haven't done enough free marketeering. Why, may, maybe we do need to listen to Liz Truss. Mm. It's like, like no, like most people like ro like mo vote reform because mm. they're hoping that you'll like that you'll understand that people do not want uh, mass immigration. Yeah. Well, I was off in the New World. I watched Rishi Sunak's speech outside mm. of Number Ten, and I was, well, it was abysmal. But I, you know, I was thinking <laughs> while I was watching, I was like, who? who do I know of in UK politics and in any party would deliver a different speech than this and different in the way that we, we would prefer it as mm. opposed to just being worse, you know, where he comes out and he says, we need to work against uh, anti anti Islamism or Islamophobia, as well as, you know, far right ideology. It's like, who is not going to have this kind of both sideism approach to things? Mm. It's like recently there was 117 million pounds. Mm, something like um, that, yeah. given out to, to increase, you know, the security of, you know, mosques, mosques and Muslims. And it was like, from who? Mm. Where is this threat coming from? <laughs> like this, like, I don't even think it was as much. I think it was more than the, the amount that was given out to Jewish communities in the UK, which are mm. actually under threat. Whatever. Well, the, the sheer fact that we see, um, despite the fact that there are many mosques in this country, or at any rate, many more mosques than used to exist in this country today. like. There are plenty of places for Muslims to worship, and yet, in many cases, they nevertheless insist on worshiping in very public places. So the idea that like, it, Islam in this country, still less political Islam, is a sort of coward, terrified mm. force, rather than, in fact, one which feels incredibly emboldened and feels incredibly, incredibly triumphalist, is, 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 is way off base. And, and I think what you said is completely spot on. Like, there is this sort of... Um, there is this uh, very p effectively politically correct cult of both sidesism, as you put it, like this sort of cult of even handedness. I, I can't seem to be uh, castigating one threat to democracy in this country. I need to make myself seem like a sensible centrist and make it clear that, oh, of course, well, it, while it goes without saying that the far right is, is also a tremendous threat to this country. Yeah, all the, 600 of them. All 600 of them yeah. are also like terribly defined. Like it's not like no one will ever um, like we saw recently with the Shawcross report, didn't we? The Shawcross report into many of Prevent's activities, the Pre Prevent being the counterterrorism uh, unit in this country, were sort of as sort of potential signs of far right activism. Were like reading Tolkien and reading Locke's second treatise well, being, of government, being anti-abortion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, this this general trend seems to have been, you know, even if it hasn't existed in uh, legal structures until relatively recently, mm. these these kinds of incidents incidents have occurred mm. throughout. Um, you know, contemporary British history, at least, very least, sort of like the during the sort of the post Blair years. I, I can't remember which university it was, but a couple of years ago, uh, uh, there was a a university hosted a society called I think it was called the Nietzsche Club, and it was literally just dedicated to reading about Friedrich Nietzsche. They got shut down for being far right. Yeah, it's yeah, a hotbed yeah. right there. Uh, yeah, it's like yeah, it's a hotbed of far right extremism. You know, it's like you know, I you know if. Uh, if ever my five needs a, a Cassus Belli to, you know, arrest me, mm. I will confess that I do occasionally read Aristotle. Yeah. I do occasionally uh, take a gander yeah, yeah. Uh, into Thomas Carlyle and Wyndham Lewis. But there's something, incred <laughs> there's something incredibly schizophrenic about it as well, because on the one hand, it, like the, every single MP, with some, potentially some honourable exceptions, many of them probably in the DUP, and one, maybe one or two in the Conservative Party, would they assent to the proposition that, that diversity is our strength. And yet at the same time, there is this um, implicit concession that community relations are in fact a very volatile thing. They constantly exist on a knife's edge. And as Patricia Sunak put it in that sort of anti-extremism speech, mm. it's precisely in order to hold together the ragged tapestry, he didn't use that word, that's my word, but the ragged tapestry of multicultural Britain, that we need this, these, I think what he called the new comprehensive anti-extremism network. That it, like, if diversity really is a strength, it wouldn't need a formidable battery of legal reinforcements to make it, to make it work. And so that, that there is such a sort of chronic schizophrenia to the way in which we talk about this, and it's partly served by this, this cult of even-handedness, this cult of both sides whereby the Conservative Party feels as though it needs to put uh, basically our vindictive colonizers and uh, the people who resent their presence here on a, on, a, on a level playing field with one another and say that they both jointly pose a threat to democracy. I do wonder, though, to kind of steal man Rishi's position, not that he really deserves it, is like, I wonder if when you're writing a speech like that, like you, 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 you speak to like counterterrorism experts or whatever mm. in the government and they say basically, 
look, if things keep going at this rate, you know, we have like a 30% chance of like a Bataclan or a Manchester arena or something mm-hmm. like that. Like they can just like scare the shit out of you. Mm. Um, because there is a real threat where if you don't do that kind of both sides, I mean, if you just give the money to the Jews and you don't also give some to, to Muslims or whatever, there could be a legitimate attack. And so we're, we're forced mm. into this paradigm under the ever present sort of Damocles hanging above our heads of like, mm. if we don't kind of, you know, try to at least, I don't know, if, if, if we don't see to at least trying to be fair, mm. basically there will be another spate of serious incidences. Mm. And, it's, and it's a mistaken calculation, but yes, I'm sure psychologically that's probably what's mm. operative at, at that. Well, I, I think we don't talk about this a lot on the right, which is like, you know, the things that a lot of people say need to be done, um, you know, in our, our, our kind of side of the aisle, if they were actually enacted, there would be a lot of terror attacks in this country and in Europe. Like, I don't think there's any way around that. And I don't think anybody's even ready to have that conversation because we have no idea what would be done to address them. It would just be like an intense acceleration effect. We have this weird paradox in Britain where effectively, in the name of social cohesion, we are arresting and censoring people yeah. for calling out things which are destroying social cohesion. <laughs> you know, we, we, are, we, are arresting, we are arresting people and, sh- and sh- throwing them in prison and censoring them and getting kicked, them kicked out of mm-hmm. their jobs for saying, um, you know, hey, I think that you know there might be. I think there might be a lot of mm. like you know, a lot of a lot of rape of of, of young of young white girls across the country yeah. by uh, by uh, by South Asian men. Like, is, it, is no one noticing this pattern? Is no one mm. noticing? And uh, you know, say so we can't do that. So it's you know, so social cohesion. It's like I, I'm pretty sure that we're past the mark if mm. like we're dealing with this like you know up and down the country. Um, so yeah, well, I, they, they see themselves as, as past the point of preventing this and at the point where the, all that can really be done is to ma- is to manage this incredibly um like this incredibly um i suppose precarious modus vivendi that exists between different communities the only the point i'm making and the funny thing about that is that they will either the other side of their mouth proclaim that diversity is our greatest strength when it is preci- when it is the cause of a, a lot of this stuff and there's also the point to be made that like practically none of what passes for far-right activism as far as like people like rishi sunak are concerned would even exist without this initial yes. act, active portrayal in the first place. Because yes, like, I, one, of the most, one of the most treacherous things that Rishi Sunak said in the course of that speech, and I, I, think, I, I think I brought it with me, like, he, oh yeah, he talked about how both the far right and Islamists pose a joint threat to the modern multicultural Britain that we are, as he put it, we are building together. Like, no one was ever asked if they wanted to engage in this quixotic project of trying to be one of the first well, pro- trying to be the first country in history to b- build a peaceful and cohesive um, multicultural I would love utopia. To no hear one him, I would love to hear him explain what he means by that. Like, why, why do Muslims specifically pose a threat to multiculturalism in well, the UK? Presumably, mm. well, I mean... What would the explanation be? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was about to take your question, literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, there is a, but there's, it's a problem. And I, I also think there's, there's something particularly sinister about it. And because, I mean, the whole... Um, the whole... Like, surely, in, in order to integrate into this country a, a bare minimum of integrating into this country as a second or third generation immigrant or what, whatever Rishi Sunak is is not to impose like a propagandistic form of set, settler colonialism onto the host population into which you're supposedly integrating and if you're saying that we are engaged in building a multicultural project together and, and you're completely riding roughshod over the national self determination right the national self-determination rights of the host in deciding whether they actually wanted to do that which mm. obviously they didn't that to me is not a sign that you've integrated very well even if you did go to Winchester, did you see that uh, there was a there was a there was a, a clip circulating around uh, X, formerly Twitter, where I think it was two Muslim guys saying like, you know, they're always pushing the British yeah, values. Yeah, they're always yeah, pushing, yeah, yeah. and it's like, oh, this is a two way. Th- th- there is there is a certain there's a two way street to this, mm. and that you guys don't really like this either. You came here, and then it was like, surprise, we're building yeah. multiculturalism. <laughs> we're all going to be like libtards. And it's like, <laughs> what what? I just I I. I I came here because other Pakistanis were here. What the yeah, hell is going on? Indeed, I, yeah. I think the same clip was literally like these two guys were speaking like I like I hate them, but I can live alongside them. Like yeah. even though I hate them, I, I can I can find it within me to live next to you. That's and I'm not like, the and but that they're saying that as like it's like the epitome of tolerance. <laughs> like I've lived in a lot of countries I was yeah, not yeah, a citizen yeah. of, and if I yeah. hated the people around me, I left. Exactly. Like, Aristotle says friendship is the basis of the polis, yes. and that does not sound like friendship <laughs> at all. We are effectively sacrificing yeah. natural solidarity as a basis for the state uh with basically top-down 
you know, control effectively, yes, and, social engineering and, and so and, on. And on the part of new immigrant communities, they're sort of, as I've been saying, like a kind of like self-restrained enmity. Like, I really don't like them, but I can just about uh, refrain. From I can just from... about not <laughs> grab them by the neck and kill them. It's like, can you imagine, uh, like, if you were going to yeah, actually... Yeah. Like, try to empathize with somebody like that. Like, if you were going to emigrate somewhere, and literally you're on the plane, you're like, you're like flying there, and you're like, I fucking hate these people. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? Like, I'm going to like survive this, well, this but like, I really don't like where I'm going. It's, it's, That's weird. It's so bizarre. That would warp you. It's so so bizarre. And the only circumstance in which I can envision myself thinking that is just not how I think at all, really. Um, I'm pleased to report, but, <laughs> but, but, but as if I need that, yeah, you need to uh, get that in there. But the, I think as well, it has a lot to do with the difference between immigrating as an individual, and, and this is sort of what you've both been touching on, and immigrating into a pre-existing diaspora, which already exists in a place. So like, mm. for example, if there was a huge, base, effectively a huge settler colony, like de facto settler colony of English people living in, I don't know, Japan, it is possible that because I would I would probably double down on my Britishness because I would be living yeah, sure. because I would feel the contrast day to day between like the the little part, uh, district of Tokyo in which I lived as an Englishman among lots of other Englishmen and the contrast with the Japanese and it's possible that I might I don't know I, I, it's not it's not make, that's not making this autobiographical it's possible that an English person might feel a, some a weird kind of uh, I don't know. Uh, grudge against the Japanese because of the Second World War, or like whatever it might be, and it's possible that resentments could um, you know, intermingle in that settler colony. And since that lots of these people do not immigrate as individuals, and then therefore they don't feel that instinctive uh, pressure to integrate as they would if they had an, uh, immigrated as individuals, they, just, they basically join the, the, the various settler colonies that we have, whether in Birmingham, whether in Blackburn, and all the rest of it. And so th I think that partly accounts for why um, fr friendship that, that doesn't even enter into consideration, or rather the friendship is directed at their own diaspora rather than at Britain as a whole. Yes, and I, I, I'm glad that you brought up the, the issue of historical grievance, because whilst that is absolutely uh, a source of uh, volatility, um, mm. so, you know, as we saw in, in places like Leicester, where these things just seem to like boil over from nowhere, mm. it, it's not even exclusively that. I mean, you can uh, understand people who... I think there's an assumption amongst the ruling class that, like, despite what, what, what might feel like day to day, an absolute obsession with identity and identity politics and all these sorts of things, there is still a weird assumption that people who are coming to the country will just happily give up mm. their, like, their entire ancestry for like, a little bit of paper that says yeah, you're a citizen. Indeed. Um, <laughs> and that just seems yeah. incredibly, like, you know, in, 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 inhumane, inhumane, yeah, inhumane, right, and yeah. uh, you know, and I don't say that in like a in like a soppy humanitarian way. I say that more in a these people don't actually like these people are in a little like you know they have their own sense of who they are, yeah. and they do not. And you know, London being one of the most uh, provincial and insular places in the country, yeah. uh, I believe that by the way. <laughs> um, yes, you know, as 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 most cosmopolitan areas are, there is a, a, a broad assumption that you know. The, the archaic concept of like of, of, of ethnic and cultural identity simply does would not resonate mm. despite also paradoxically it being the basis for the multicultural Britain <laughs> for which we are building uh, yeah. so it's like so are these just like is religion like you know religion and all these other things are meant to just be empty signifiers mm. they're meant to adorn nicely the public spaces but no one is actually allowed to uh, hold them in any is not allowed to necessarily revere them or act on them or affect or they're not allowed to become political mm. in any way which again like is not going to happen like y you can't realistically expect to have a society where every single religion under the sun is celebrated and is revered and uh, you know is encouraged and tolerated and at the same time you impose like you know liberal secularism on everyone and expect well, hang on a minute. Am I like? It's my like. Am I just meant to have religion as like this nice little quaint thing in private life? Yeah, yeah. in private life. Or is, is, is am I not allowed to affect change in the world in accordance with my with my moral principles? Indeed. Um, but but also on the I, I veered off there slightly. Yeah. But on the on the historical grievance front, it doesn't even matter if it's historical. Like people want to be different. People want to be themselves. They want to feel as though that they have uh, a place in. The universe that gives them a sense of ground, of rootedness, of groundedness. Mm -hmm. So I like, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a there's a scene from The Sopranos where Tony, where Tony Soprano is going off on a 
basically explain to his therapist like you know say like you Americans when you mm. when you when you brought us here you brought us here for cheap labor and you said that you're going to be an American now well guess what some of us wanted to remain Italian yeah, yeah. and it's like that's like, like so you might say oh the, 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 the historical grievance between you know no, th like assuming like, like well it is assuming that um, America is a like an, essentially at least nominally or like a like a white Anglo-Saxon pr uh, Protestant country um, originally, yeah. yes, originally. We wouldn't assume that, um, you know, we wouldn't say, okay, like, you know, in like England, America, Italy, they had, some, like, you know, I can't think of any, like, r real sort of, like, blood feud which exists between Englishmen and, and or, or Americans and Italians so now, it... but this specific gripe exists amongst the Italian descended Indeed. population yeah. and the mm -hmm. wider American population, and it's, n so it's not a historical thing, but it is more just a sense of, I want to be me. Yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it's a function of the fact that like, human beings cleave to their identity. And so even if there is not, as you say, even if there is not a, like, uh, an, an, any kind of particularly historicized ancestral grudge between Group A and Group B, nevertheless, m making Group A uh, live in close proximity to Group B, th those grudges are likely to develop. I'm also r reminded of the scene in The Sopranos where the Italian-American mobsters go back to Italy mm. and all the Italians hate their guts because they <laughs> yeah. just think they're Americans. Yeah. It's like at a certain point, like you can't go back. Yeah, it's true. But, I, I, you know, I think it's interesting on the, the sort of everybody who wants to come here wants to become a part of Britain. It's like, yet, yeah, first of all, it's evidently not true now, but it's also not true at, in any country that I'm aware of at any point in history that like, like we'll use Italian Italy and, uh, and the UK, for example, it's not like a bunch of Italians ever went to the UK and were like, oh, this is obviously much better than our thing. Mm. Why don't we just make our country more like this? Mm. Th that's never happened. Mm. Everybody wants to be individualized. And mm. that's a good thing. I mean, that's like actual diversity in like a non in a global cliche sense. way, but mm. like in a, in a good way. Mm. It's so almost as if we should, we should recognize our right to difference, yes, to, in, to borrow in, a term. <laughs> indeed, indeed. No, I, I, I agree with you, Samuel. Um, uh, but okay, but if we if we're getting back to I suppose like solutions uh, to this to this problem, um, we we so we're not encouraged by reform. Like what like so we got a, we've got an election coming up this year. I, I expect I, I doubt it will be in the May in May. I think mm. it will be actually in very close proximity to the American election, which will make it a particularly interesting autumn. Very fun. Very uh, fun. But, but yeah, very. But um, I mean, so what do we want? To, what, what, what do you want reform to achieve in that election, if anything? What do you want to happen? And, and how do you see the post-2024 fallout developing on the right? Um, I think that, like, you know, if the thing that reform really should do is basically, like, get a better graphic designer, for one. <laughs> um, put, you know, the con-socialism jibes on the back burner. Put the anti-Semitism... <laughs> Like, you know, <laughs> well, put patrol on away. The back, on the back burner suggests they're going to wheel them out again. I think it, in, the, it, in the trash is what you mean. Yes, yes, well, <laughs> I try to, well, we have to, be, we have to be pragmatic. We want to win, don't we? But, it's true. Um, it's true. Yes, I think that they should really, like any, like, I think it's good that part, that, you know, minor parties or fringe parties aspire to be something other than a one issue uh, mm -hmm. force. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what made UKIP in 2015 such, a, such like, you know, a success. I mean, yeah, they didn't win a seat. But did they, did we, uh, was it fair to say that UKIP in 2015 aspired to be more than a single issue party? They absolutely did. Like, I mean, they had like the, the way that I guess you could like visualize it is, is that they had, you know, they had the wheel and in the middle they had their, you know, their commitment to leave the European Union. Mm. But around that they had things like yeah. cutting foreign aid, yeah. uh, you know, sort of like I think it was like basically reforming the NHS, all these other things. So you're, you're contrasting UKIP in 2015 with, say, its origins in the British group in the 90s, where it really was just European. Yes, it okay. was very much a case of, you know, they, they maintained their commitment to leaving the European Union, but they had various mm. other things on the side. There was like, you know, there was like various, like, you could go to like the UKIP 2015 manifesto and there was stuff in there about like yeah. animal rights, healthcare, foreign aid, economy. But the thing that makes, uh, you, you are right, they obviously had a manifesto they yeah. had to do, and like Susan Evans was a big part of like spearheading that. And so, you know, there, there was that in 2015. But nevertheless, I'd, I'd argue that reform has gone even further than that because, like, in, in, like, implicit in the existence of UKIP was the idea that once we've achieved that central plank of our, like, raison d'etre, namely leaving the European Union, will sort of all else will come. All after. else will, yeah, it will just come. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they didn't say no. They didn't say that. They, they, the implicit understanding was, and this is proved by the fact that you, 
Nigel Farage, Nigel Farage summarily left UKIP after 2016. Uh, yes, after 2016, is that we would um, cease to exist, that our raison d'etre would be gone. Whereas in reform, there seems to be an understanding that we're not just here to try and uh, scourge the Tories into reforming themselves, we're actually here to try and replace them. As, as I recall it, Farage, when he was running for the leadership of UKIP, basically said, we don't want to, be, we shouldn't be in it, we, we shouldn't be a single issue party, even if mm. this is absolutely the bit the, the, our, our namesake right this is our namesake policy i'm agreeing with you but what i'm saying is is that i think reform have taken that uh commitment to be something other than a single issue party a step further in that there is not that implicit understanding in reform that they will pack up as soon as they've as soon as they've yes uh, achieved that, 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 that's true they want um, to they, they 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 want to replace the conservative party in the same way that the labor party replaced the liberals at the uh, at the uh, in the early decades of the last century hmm. um and i think I, look, I, 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 I share all of your... Maybe, maybe, we should, maybe we should get into it a little bit before talking a bit too much about uh, what's going on. Like, can you explain why you... I, I couldn't agree with you more, but can you explain why you don't like the term uh, con-socialist uh, to, to our viewers? I oh, because I think that... Well, I don't consider myself a, a socialist, but I will say that um, the, uh, the fixation with socialism, I think, is a very, very American thing. I think that people, generally speaking, have a... Uh, I guess sort of softer interpretation of socialism in Britain. I'm not saying that people are rapidly anti-capitalist. Like mm -hmm. I think from what from what I've seen and what I've read and, and, and polls that have been done, people seem to have like I wouldn't say that they're, that they're, that they're anti-capitalist and they're anti-socialist, but rather they just don't have a they they want they have a very vague idea of well we need another economic we need you know not a fundamentally different economic system, yeah. but they don't really see it in either of the prevailing economic ideologies which which you know have defined modernity and the thing is that you actually see this in both the right and the left and especially the left because when you come across leftist activists and when you see them online they don't actually characterize themselves as socialists Never. or communists anymore they're always anti-capitalist they're yeah. always anti they, they are it's an entirely negativistic bent to their to their political philosophy yeah, no. and it's a general sense of i want so, i want things to change i want things to be different but I'm, I've been so embedded, in, like the idea that, that, that we have, that, that, that capitalism is just this omnipresent thing that, 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 that is inert and will not go away and will just remain with us, seems to afflict even its most, like, it's the most vicious enemies mm. of its existence. There's also the, and I, I agree with you, and I think there's also, like, this, like, it helps induce the complacent belief that we're still up against people like Michael Foote, when we're clearly not. Like, like, yes. like there is a new species of radical in, in town. That too. And, um, that, like, our, our gun should be aimed on that, not on these sort of museum pieces. Um, mm. uh, Do you recall the, 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 the Brexit Party manifesto? Do you remember did that absolute keynote? In, in 2019? Yes. Mm. I mean, I've got, like... No, no, is the answer. Like, they were, like, I mean, I can't list every single policy off the top of my head, but like I, <laughs> I, 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 I can absolutely like send you it. And it was like there was there were some things in there where it's like okay, this is obviously like survived to like the Reform Party. These things have just always been like kicking around as like certain issues, but it's like they were like promising of the Brexit dividend. Oh yeah, like they were yeah. they were basically promising control of fisheries, and it's like yeah. this yeah. is effectively like you know. To coin a phrase, this is national socialism. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is effectively like you know. This is a very, despite saying classically liberal on the tin, it yeah. was quite dirigist in its economic proposals. But even, you know, even if over all of that was just the general commitment of we want to get out of the European Union. Yeah, well, I, th I, I suppose like the basic point being is that like, like what we need is not so much um, a, a kind of a, a revival of the late 1970s and early 1980s, like like a sort of an, an economic liberalisation form of medicine. Like we need something more, much more akin to a national renewal and, and issues like immigration as the sort of cultural issues that we talk about on the New Culture Forum should always be prior to any kind of economic obsessions yeah, in, that, in that agenda. And Tice, uh, who I think is a well-meaning man, um, and I, I don't have any particularly per personal, I, I don't have any actually personal hostility towards him. He just doesn't seem to me to be uh, like fit, fit for the moment in, uh, in which we find ourselves. Yes, that's, that, that's true. I think um, Curtis Yarvin once said that you can tell how right wing an organization is by how bad their graphic design is. <laughs> but the problem is, is in the UK and especially with reform, it's not due to them being actually right wing. It's just like sheer incompetence. And so, it does inspire a lot of hope. And, and there's also, and I don't know whether this has to do with the fact that Tice is a business. It, like, has I think he made a lot of money in the city or something like that. Like it has an incredibly soulless corporate feel to it. Like, you, like it, it, again, it, it's sort of 
like if you look if you were to look at their graphics like quite apart from the content if you were to look at their graphics you could be forgiven for thinking that all these people really think we need is just a, a little bit of tinkering here a little bit of tinkering there like it doesn't sort of turn, turn the dial turn the dial it doesn't you know, you. slide things up and down indeed, it's indeed. like you know it's just like a nice, and 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 streamline and and, and yeah. the, the thing is is that it's interesting that you say that because we would not consider um most people i don't think would well as i said before like like this party on the tin says that we are classically liberal but most and most people would not consider that to be the, the reform part of reform uk to be a post liberal party most yeah. people wouldn't associate that but that is kind of what they're doing because post liberalism as a general school of thought is the belief that well it doesn't actually fundamentally challenge the assumptions of a of a liberal capitalist democracy it really just seeks to rebalance the political system within the overt and window. Yes. And I don't know if you know this, but there was a pamphlet uh, produced by David Goodhart, who wrote an article in The Times recently about how diversity is causing a whole array of problems, which is, which is largely true. He's noticed, is he? Yes, <laughs> he's, no, he's noticed. Well, actually, he's noticed for, for a while, because yeah. in, in 2006, he wrote, a, he wrote a pamphlet called Progressive Nationalism. Mm. And he basically said that, like, look, one of the things... like. There is a growing sense of, 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 of nationalism and uh, I guess you'd call it, a, a, there are reactionary forces at play. We on both the centre right and the centre left need to construct a, uh, an ideology or a political model which can, offer, or can, which can offer belonging, which can offer a degree of uh, security and otherwise, mm. uh, which in an, an otherwise globalised liberal capitalist society. And so, you know, there is a degree to which you can look at the tactics like reform and go, is this like, is this containment? Because that's what it seems like uh, from time to time. Because you know, I, like reform does like yeah, they do talk about like the small boats and this sort of thing. They do like occasionally chime in on like you know how immigration is just, how the Tories have failed to deal with uh, immigration. But again, these things tend to be they tend to be juggling the issues rather than mm. this is the centerpiece and these are other, these are the different aspects yeah. around it we're going to turn our political movement around this we're going to drive it over the structure that exists currently because we genuinely believe that the political system is out of mm. date or at the very least it, it doesn't serve the interests of the people and i think you can have some supply side if you really must you can have you can throw in some supply side reforms oh, of if, course if, you can. into the mix as well if you like and but like the, the problem is is the way in which tice leads with them and like that is not like if the reform really want to get into like the um, sort of sdp territory like in the 1983 election where where there was a uh, where like Michael Foot had a serious uh, challenge to his to his right, mm. and Thatcher had a serious challenge to her left, and the SDP nearly, nearly, nearly did quite well in that election. If you want to get into the twenties and start winning by elections, I, I do think that you need to stop this talk of consocialism. Stop acting like we're 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 we're, we're facing a, a revival of the post-war uh, consensus. Stop only talking about tax cuts. Your your primary fo focuses should be. Like, like immigration and DEI across and, and the And the, the point that, I, that I'm just making there is that after that, mm -hmm. once, once it's established that you do actually need that sort of central, uh, you need that central focus, mm -hmm. you've also got to then go, okay, then is this like in detail, is this actually what we want? Because most people would look at the proposals and things like Goodhart's progressive nationalism and go, this isn't exactly what people believe when it comes to reducing diversity. This just seems to me like the status quo where you try to bind an increasingly diverse and multicultural society by effectively imposing liberal values from the top down. A new narrative. Like, yeah. you know, imposing some, wealth, uh, some sort of welfare sh chauvinism yeah. here and there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. greatly emphasizing yeah. the ownership of British citizenship as if, like, people, as if we said, like, it's very, it's very difficult to substitute... Uh, blood for paper, yeah, you know, yeah. um, whether that be a, a little passport or a, or, or, or or money yeah. or like you know, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of these, I think a lot of people seem to think that they can just hold together society based on economic development. I yeah. think it's a completely wrong thing to do. It is interesting to me that reform and mainly reform doesn't seem to have learned the biggest lesson of politics of the last ten years, which is that. People are not comfortable just voting against things anymore. Yes. You need to give people something to vote for. Like people voted for UKIP mm. because they're actually they're voting for Brexit. People will even vote for the SDP because they like the SDP's policies. Oh, absolutely. P nobody's voting for reform because they like reform. They're just voting for them because they hate the Tories. Mm. But that's not actually good enough. Yeah. And I don't know what they could possibly do or what anybody in UK politics could possibly do at this point to give someone something to vote 
four. And mm. Until somebody kind of like cuts through that Gordian knot, I think we're going to be talking about the same thing I, yeah. on this podcast I, I, week I, after week. I, I think that you no like the, the, the negativistic problem. Uh, I think yes, I think that also exists on on the right. But I would also add to that that um, when we are dealing with issues of, you know. Will, will reform do well? Will reform, like, you know, hoover up votes on the Tories? I think it's actually, I think there's like a, a very non zero chance, like 50 50, that the next election is basically 2001 2.0, where you have a large Labour landslide, but turnout basically plummets mm. because, mm -hmm. the, the, because yeah. the conclusion is foretold. And whilst you do have, whilst like minor parties might gain here and there, um, like the bulk of like right wing individual, right wing voters just kind of like stay home because. They're not. They either don't know that reform like exists, and if they do, they might not be tantalised by it. Like the recent by elections, again, don't seem to be doing much favours for them um, in terms of like you know presenting themselves as like a credible alternative. Oh yeah, it's like a, as a force with momentum behind it. Um, so yeah, I think yes, I think that negativistically there are for that exact reason. I think that you're actually going to see a large drop in participation at the next election, and I think actually that might be a more effective message than actually voting for reform. Because it's mm. the, because yes okay fine it doesn't you're not voting for something but at the very least it's like I would rather make it my, my my intentions absolutely clear that I want absolutely nothing to do with the way that politics is currently operating rather than cast my vote for a party that really has some like you know is not really doing what I think most like right leaning conservative individuals want or want them to focus on. Yeah no I I. I definitely agree. I agree with what both of you too. I, I agree with what both of you have said there. Um, it seems to me, though, that precisely because we do not have a political vehicle in this country yet uh, for, our, for our sort of um, you know political philosophy to, to be to be carried through, whether couched in negativistic terms or whether couched in positive terms, mm. um, it seems to me that for the moment our main priority should be doing precisely doing our best to bring about precisely what Peter Hitchens thought needed to happen in 2010, namely the sort of the, the irreversible destruction of the Conservative Party. Yes, bring it like cutting off the regime's right arm. <laughs> yeah, quite, yes. And hoping it can grow. Amputating uh, it so then we can get something to punch uh, the Leviathan <laughs> in the face. <laughs> Indeed, hoping we can, it can grow a bionic one, we can graft a bionic one onto it as well. Uh, so that, that, it seems to me that that just needs to happen, like the precondition of any kind of national renewal is surely for the Conservative Party to cease existing because yeah, uh, like, uh, even though Labour is in, will in, across a, some metrics potentially be, be worse like, in terms of like what they're actually doing, it may have more of a radicalizing effect because it's much, it's much more um, radicalizing to be stabbed re relentlessly in the front than to be slowly euthanized. And like the Tory Party has been slowly euthanizing us for, for 40 and, and years. The, and the, the, the like the black pilling thing is just like they could be like going towards like a cat, like you know, say, oh, the Tories on on, on soon needs to change course. There's a catastrophe incoming. It's like they still might get like 150 seats. Mm -hmm. Like that's like it's like oh, we've got a mountain to climb here. Like they can literally like do the exact opposite of what they said they were going to do, mm. and then some, and still they like have like a sizable number of MPs in Parliament, they still have a, like, a sizable like, base of, of, of support. Um, that, I think, is like, I think that, you, yes, I think that reform can, is, is like one of several means to basically chipping away at the, at, at the Tories' monopoly on the right. Um, but I don't think it has much more purpose than that. And I think that even then, actually going out and supporting and campaigning is conditional on a lot of local politics, you know, because some places are, some places will be more inclined to vote reform, but other places it's like, you know, it's like, you know, will, 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 like, will it make, will it push through? Probably not. Mm. I think we often kind of take it as axiomatic that if the Tories were to be completely obliterated, something would rise from the ashes. And while I would like to think that's true, I don't know, I was, I was thinking about it again in America and I was like, there's not actually any guarantee of that happening. Definitely not. You might just That's salt true. the earth and that literally nobody can pull together like a, a, a proper response mm. in, in, in the coming years. I think there are people interested in doing it, but maybe it was just like a rare black hole moment for myself. I was like, there's no actual guarantee that like a new kind of answer to, to, to the question everybody's asking is like, what are we actually for will actually arise. And I, I wonder what the UK would look like if the Tories get obliterated at the, the next election. And then for like two or three years, nobody really steps up to the plate. 
Star I, I, mean, I mean, yeah. Star Mageddon. <laughs> but like, no, I mean, you know, we had Peter Hitchens in here, and I, I, I think it's actually very irresponsible for him to say um, people should leave, especially because he wouldn't answer the question to where. But I do think that if that happened, people would flee in like a, in a large way. Like if you don't have a, a, a proper response, like almost immediately, I think people will just get up and go. I, I hate, I hate defeatism. I hate the, 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 the blackpilling propaganda from a lot, like the, the doomerism from large sections of the right. Like, can you imagine like, can you imagine like Alfred the Great sort of like, like you know, <laughs> after, he's, after he's lost a major battle, he's sort of like walking over huddled to like the marshes of like Wessex or wherever. You know, he sits yeah. down huddling, he burns someone's yeah. cakes and he goes, oh, it's over. I'm going to have to move to Crimea to get like <laughs> Slav trad wife. It's like, shut up. You're going to be, you're going to be king of England and you're going to form the greatest country on earth. Deal with it. Like, yeah. I, 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 I really don't think that we need any more, especially considering the fact that, you know, telling people to leave. Okay, where? It's like, am I going to go to, like, France? Well, they're, they're, they're in great shape, aren't they? It's not like they're dealing with many of the great systematic problems that we've got here. Mm. Not at all. I don't know. I was just, I guess I was contrasting it to America because I think in America, with the American mentality and how, how things are going over there, if you did have, like, a Tory wipeout, it would somebody the next yeah, day, yeah. somebody would jump there's in There's a there. can-do startup spirit. So. Yeah. Yes. And here, I, like, again, I don't like the, the doomerism either, but I was thinking, it was like, I think, you know, me if you went like kind of a year, two years, because it's pretty bad already here. Yes, People yes. are like, I want to leave. Um, if, if, if you wait too long, if somebody doesn't seize that opportunity, I, I, do, think, I do think people will just be like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. And that, that can't, point can't be stressed enough. There's nothing axiomatic about like, the, um, the, the obliteration of the Tory party being followed by a kind of, you know, like a, a positive movement with national renewal. There's nothing guaranteed about that, which is why I said like it should be like that, why I phrase it as a sort of a precondition for national mm -hmm. renewal rather than a guarantee of but national on, renewal. On the, but on this issue yeah. of, the lack, of the lack of, like, you know, well, the, the lack of, of, of uh, what, what you might call natural successors to the Tory party. Mm. I mean, you have reform, but there are like, let's face it, we consider them one of several, I think most people consider them one of several options and, you know, uh, but isn't this also downstream from like two things? The first is that who do we who do we have on the right in Britain that could broadly be described as a natural leader or a good public speaker or someone who is charismatic or can actually build a movement around them? And second, you know, are many like right leaning British people who've got money willing to put money behind such a movement because? Like, I think there's a, there's a weird tendency I see amongst a lot of, like, very, uh, I guess you, you might sort of, like, well-paid, very influential sort of, like, backers and donors of, like, right-leaning movements, is that if they, they often don't see the point in sinking money into something which is inherently unprofitable, like politics. Like, I, 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 I don't know if you know, but there's an excellent thread, I'll have to find it somewhere, by, uh, by Lomez, where he basically says that, one of the reasons why the left do so well in America is because their funders basically just go... They're happy to make a loss. We're happy to make a loss. It's like you can actually like make some cultural change. They're happy yeah. for the trade-off, whilst a lot of, like, you know, like Jeremy Hosking sinks money into, like, Lawrence Fox <laughs> to, like, be a naughty school child. But, like, that's, <laughs> but that's really it. That's an example of making a loss and, like, not really making the change that you want. But um, I think that, you know, but yeah, but just going back to, like, you know, YouTube, like, do, who is there on the right that can actually finance such a movement and also be the face of a movement mm. um, that is actually going to be sincerely, genuinely anti-establishment and not just like, oh, I'm going to bait a few trans people, I'm going to bait a few Muslims and then leave it at that. Yeah. Do you, do you think it, it is a conundrum? And I think that like, by far the most important um, question about this com upcoming election is that like, I'm not actually too interested in the, the dynamics of, oh my God, Bolsover has got, like, I don't care about the, the <laughs> like, the, the sort of cephology of it. I'm not going to be listening, watching John Curtis's analysis that evening. But I, I, what I am interested in is, like, what the fallout is on the right and like, how the right organizes itself in order to contend with this, this new movement in order to avert Starmer from being in office, from being, as you put it, uh, Starmageddon. Um, I, I, um, the, I, well, one elephant in the room that we haven't mentioned is, of course, like the the, the person of Nigel Farage. I mean, he is he is, like by far one like one of the most charismatic uh, figures in, in British politics. I suspect reform would be doing much better if he was at the helm. Do you see? Do you see him as the potential kingmaker in this in this sort of post twenty twenty in this post twenty twenty four sort of right wing 
I think, he, I think he would absolutely need to be on board, but I don't think that he would be the person to lead it on account of the fact that he seems to want to... And I don't blame him, because, mm. like, N like, Nigel's whole pitch was, we're going to leave the European Union, and mm -hmm. I'm going to rally support to leave the European Union. And he's kind of done that. Like, he didn't promise to, like, save us from Stam again. He didn't promise to, like, save us from, like, demographic woes or, like, you know... Uh, you know, the sort of like the Blairite regime, multiculturalism, whatever. Um, you know, he has like, you know, he's set out what he said to, what, what he said he would do. And now he is very, I think, very much in the mindset of wanting to be a, being, of being a talking head on GB News and, and, and you know, like having... Being Trump's right-hand man. But yeah, and like, you know, having, the, you know, sort of like, you know, going into having, like sitting at his little, a little table, having yeah. a little makeup done and being like, what's happening today? Like, yeah. you know, I think that like, that's a cozy gig and like no one's blaming him. But um, I, I don't think that we can like play stock in like Farage, like coming to save us, which is frustrating because he is charismatic. Yeah. He is like actually a, a, like a good, like public speaker, like Brexit party, like the Brexit party rallies were like, were fun. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't... He, he's also the kind of person who, going back to the problem Evan was raising, well, both you and Evan have been raising. Um, is that he's also someone who people will vote for rather than vote mm. for as an instrument to vote against someone. Yes, although there, oh, admittedly there would probably be a lot of people who would actually vote against him because I think that... Was it, was it Cummings who... Well, who sorry, what I, what, I, what I meant about that is that the people wouldn't, don't purely view Farage as, oh, yes, a, they as, don't, an, as an agent of chaos, they view him as an agent of, of change as well. Yes, that's, all, yes, that's true. Positive change. Um, um, well, it's, it's much the same problem that Trump's going to have in the, the US, which is that people will vote for Trump and they will also literally go to the polls to vote against yeah, him. Yeah, that's yes, very true. Yes, the, 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 uh, did you see... I can't remember which state it was, but like Trump wasn't on the ballot and it was like none of the candidates won yeah, like, like literally yeah, like yeah. you know none of the stated candidates was mm. like the top like the, got the most votes like people <laughs> there were people filming their ballots where they were putting they were writing in donald trump on every <laughs> single like you know elected position yeah, no, he's a... biden's yeah. gonna have this problem too in a big way I, we were talking about this earlier that people basically a low turnout which i think we're mm. gonna see in the u.s which is i think it was michigan 10 percent of the people in the democratic primary basically were like none of the above none of the candidates it's gonna be very interesting because I think you're going to have, on one hand, you're going to have people come out in droves for Trump because they feel like he's had an election stolen from him. And you're also going to have a bunch of people refuse to show up for Biden because of Israel-Palestine. Anyway, an you aside. Know, but, no, 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 it's an important one. But I, I, there was just perhaps a, uh, one final uh, question to finish on, gents. And like maybe, uh, like I know Evan and I have spoken about this quite a lot, so maybe you can kick us off. Like, do you think that there is any hope to be found in the possibility that many of the people who like because you, you, you were saying like people have these sort of cushy gig in the media it's so much easier to throw stones than it is to actually exact meaningful change do you think that if some of the more charismatic talking heads like some on the right mm -hmm. some of the more charismatic people in the commentariat class and they are again as opposed to farage who's quite new to that game the person mm. who stands out most here is probably douglas murray um do you think if it, do you think it's possible that things might get to such a bad state that we see people like murray getting more involved in in, in politics, and would that make him a meaningful difference? Well, I mean, I, I asked Douglas Murray this question in Israel, and as much as I'm a great of fan of, of Douglas, um, I, I think it's very difficult because any time that I talk to any of these people, and I won't name names other than him because he's, he's admitted it publicly, their biggest aspiration is basically to make enough money or get enough clout that they can move to America. Mm. That's, that's the real thing. I, I can't think of a single person who's like, I want to get this massive platform so that, you know, the day after the Tories get decimated, yeah. I, I can jump in there or something. Everybody's literally thinking, how do I get to America? How can, yeah, land. or, or like the, the south of France or something <laughs> like that. Like it's just, I do wonder, I don't know, this is like uncharacteristically black pill of me, but I do wonder like maybe if a good strategy would be to try to hoover up like 20 young Brits, if you know, if you had the money, send them all to DC, put them in like American think tanks, try to like, come up with like a, a counter offensive from abroad and then bring them back in because i just don't think that in in this london thing you know as much as i'm a part of it and you know make my living in it i think the greatest ambition is to be like the biggest show on gb news or to have a Substack that's bringing in six figures and that's mm. kind of where it ends whereas in america it's always and then what's next and then what's next mm. you don't have this thing with farage where he's like i've done my thing and now i can go and sit in the makeup chair it's always another step, another step, another step. What does this get me? So I wonder if that could be like injected into a couple 20 year olds 
and then they could be uh, flown back and parachuted into Westminster. I, I, I can I can say without much detail that this has been tried a couple of times. Although I, just on the point about like how in Britain it seems that we 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 you, you set up a, a Substack that gives you some some pocket money every month, and then that's it, game over. Congratulations, you defeated the woke. Mm. Uh, <laughs> like you know, s spoiler, not really. But not with quite. but um, I think that. I think that as a, as a political culture, we're constantly suspended in conversation and shooting the breeze. I think that even when people are taught, even people, even elected officials, they always use the language of, they always use passive language. They always use the language of conversation. Well, we need to, we need to have a, we need to have a really tough conversation about this. You see it all the time with commentary with like, like politicians. It always results in, we need to consider maybe possibly somewhat consider entertaining <laughs> like you know this, this like you know the idea that, 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 we're, we're, that yeah, yeah. We're, we need to move in a direction we need to move we need to we need yeah. to start talking or we need to consider talking we need talking. to have a dialogue and we need to have a dialogue and it's like like can someone just like like end like yeah. you know this like you're like the, can we have a, a little less conversation Juan, Juan, Juan de, a little more action please Juan de, Juan de Noso Cortez who I brought up on this program before called that um, the sort of the liberal cult of la clase discutidora like just the discussing class yes. which, is, con which yes. is constantly going to defer the, it depoliticizes the, everything it, it depoliticizes it, everything let's just talk about it and it's definitely like I like talking I think that's evident to viewers who watch the show regularly but um, and my my my, temp, my main temperament and is fundamentally um, sort of philosophical and contemplative and re reflective. Yeah. I don't actually find po politics doesn't give me that much satisfaction in itself. Nevertheless, like finding ourselves in this incredibly urgent moment, is that, which is generally genuinely where I think we are as a country. I just hope that the like because obviously there's nothing wrong with clout chasing in principle and trying to grow your Substack and trying to be influential, mm. but there's nothing wrong with that. But does there come a point where that is just not enough to fulfill you anymore and the prospect of going to the states or going to the south of france is not enough for you i mean when are people going to start to think i actually really care about britain and i do want to get involved i mean if you're like if that's your disposition like i would recommend um i would recommend reading i think it's the true believer by eric, by eric hoffer i'm reading it right now it's oh, a great uh, book while oh, i'm rereading excellent it. Yeah. but yes like at the moment we seem to be completely suspended in like We've got plenty. We've got plenty men of words, right? Yeah, we've yeah. got a, well, men of letters. We've got people who will happily write and pontificate. You know, to what extent that that's always high quality is debatable. Mm. But we have a lot of them. Uh, the fanatics are few. Are, 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 you know, few and far between. Mm. And uh, like, really, like be, having any sort of political zeal or actually caring about politics, even within like political circles, supposedly yeah, yeah. political yeah, yeah. circles, is considered weird. Yeah. Mm. It's like you know, no, I actually enjoy the militant processes. <laughs> <laughs> to borrow it from from Alain de Badiou, I, I I I I like the idea of yeah. like th that, like I like I was too young to vote in the referendum. Like I, I you know maybe that's a t testament to how young I am compared to many people who actually care about politics as a consistent thing. But you know that was a time in you know history and it, you know that you know and my first impression of politics where it was like like you know I saw I saw but you know democracy and politics completely unfiltered and it was wonderful it mm. was exciting felt like that things were changing things were in motion and now it's like we're back to you know square one and mm. i think that that is kind of ceremoniously fittingly going to happen when much in much in the same way in 2016 you had trump and brexit happening at the same time and now in 2024 and uh you know we've got the us and, and the uk whilst the us is, is going to Probably continue down the path and keep the po the, uh, the, the 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 populist revolution alive. Here, it seems to be slowly being squashed under mm. the thumb of human rights lawyers and and, and, and yes. civil servants and such, saying, you know, we need to be we need to be nicer to people. We need to be we need to have conversations. We mustn't be so divisive. Yeah. It's like you know, divisiveness is the essence of politics. If you do not like division, you should not be talking about or participating or anywhere near politics. You are robbing people of their freedom of their determination. Um, both in a political sense and also in a, in a sense of actually wanting to do things. Like, I'm not surprised that people are demoralized because anytime anyone wants to do anything, it's kind of like... Gosh, you actually really? want to do something. Yeah, gosh. <laughs> let, 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 us, let us hope that, that we can perhaps in the coming years have more Caesar-like figures and fewer Catos. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us on Deprogram. Samuel right. Martin, Evan, thanks as ever. You've been watching Deprogrammed. Make sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment if you wish, and we shall see you on the next one. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below 
or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.